the topic I was asked to address today was what exactly is the cultural definition of love according to these Orthodox Jews? What do they think? So what I'm going to do with you is I'm going to carry you. It, there's two ways to really know what cultures believe about any particular concept. One is by examining their literature. And the other is by interviewing people and finding out about their oral tradition. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to carry you through a brief tour of the literature and the oral tradition regarding this concept of love within, within uh, Jewish Orthodoxy, at least 2,000-year-old tradition. And I think that you'll find it um, provocative at the very least. Yeah. We'll start with a story. The Talmud describes a scene that took place here in Israel about 2,000 years ago, uh, very close to Caesarea on the coast. When the scene opens, so the Romans have just banned the study of Torah. And there's a great Talmudic sage there, Rabbi Akiva, and he goes out into a public square and he starts to gather the masses. Come, come, who wants to learn Torah? And a large group gathers. Now, many of the people who were there were probably coming just to see what was going to happen to this poor fellow because everyone knew how the Romans would respond. <coughs> And some people may have come to learn Torah. It's possible. As he's about to begin the lecture, there's a secular uh, Jew who sees what this lunatic rabbi is doing and cries out to him, Rebbe, our teacher, don't you know what the Romans are going to do to you? And Rebbe Kiva looks at him and he tries to explain by breaking into metaphor. And he says, it's like a fox that is walking along the riverbank, and the fox sees fish darting back and forth in the river. And the fox cries out to the fish and says, wouldn't you? like to come up here with me and we could live together like your ancestors lived with my ancestors. So the fish, who are safe in the water, look back at the fox and they say, are you the animal they call the cleverest of all animals? You're not clever, you're a fool. If here in the water we're afraid of you, how much more so we should be terrified if we would go up there on the bank with you. At that point, the Romans show up. They see Akiva. They push through the crowd. They go over to him. They grab him. They bind him. They drag him off. They throw him into a prison in Caesarea. And outside the prison, he hears this sound of them constructing this giant torture platform. The sun sets. Rabbi Akiva's students, thousands of them, heard that he was captured, and they've come to say goodbye. The jailer comes, opens the door, takes Akiva. They drag him out. They put him up onto this giant torture platform. It is now night outside. And they're about to begin this procedure. They take these giant potato peelers, and they start ripping the skin off of his body. And he's hemorrhaging from every part of his body. And at that moment, with total calm, he closes his eyes. And the students recognize what's about to happen. He is about to do the nighttime repetition of the Shema, the declaration that God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the God is one. He's about to do it. It's a religious obligation upon every Jew, morning and evening, to do such a thing. He's going to fulfill his obligation before he dies. And one of the students cries out to him and says, Rebbe, our teacher, 
What are you doing? And what's bothering them is there is a Jewish law that says that if someone is in a state of extreme distraction, they are not expected to recite the Shema. They do not have to recite the, the, the oneness of God's name at, at, at any point. What is extreme distraction? So the example that's given in the Talmud is a person on their wedding night does not have to say Shema. They're thinking about other things. Okay. If that's the case with a wedding night, how much more so when they're combing the skin off of your body with iron combs? So the student says, Rebbe, Adkan, what are you doing? <coughs> Rebbe Kiva opens his eyes and he says, my whole life, my whole life, I've been waiting to fulfill the verse that says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your Soul, which means even if they take your soul, my whole life I've been waiting to fulfill that verse, and now I'm not going to fulfill it. And Rabbi Kiva closes his eyes, and he begins to sing, Shema Yisrael, Shem Elokeinu, Shem Elokeinu. And before he can conclude and say the words, God is one, as he's saying the word one, but he never finishes the word, his soul leaves his body. The angels in heaven, according to the Talmudic report, cry out. And they say, it's not fair. It's not fair, they say. Zu Torah v'zu this is Torah and this is its reward? Rabbi Kiva was not born religious. He was also born secular. And at 40 years old, for the first time, he stumbles into a group of Orthodox Jews and hears about Orthodoxy and decides he wants to start becoming religious and he heads off to Yeshiva. And when he gets to yeshiva, he learns and he learns and he learns and he ends up staying in yeshiva for 24 years. And after 24 years, he ends up becoming the greatest scholar of the generation, the leader of the generation. This is Torah and this is its reward, the Talmud says. And a heavenly voice calls out, God calls out and calms the scene and says, Rabbi Kiva, welcome. You've been invited into the front row in the next world. And the curtain comes down on the scene, and it's dramatic, and the applause begins. Okay. Beautiful story, very moving. The more that you know about Judaism, the less this story makes sense. And I will try to show you some of what is obviously wrong with this story. Once again, to run through the story, the Romans ban the study of Torah. The first thing Rabbi Kiva does is he runs out in public and starts teaching, who wants to learn? Who wants to learn? Okay, now, when Rabbi Kiva did that, didn't he know he was going to die? <coughs> and where in a religion that so treasures life could there possibly be room for, let's call it what it is, suicide? Does Judaism believe in such a thing? How could that be? And if you'll tell me, well, we all know that there are three cardinal sins that you have to give up your life for, those three cardinal sins are if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, kill another person or I'm going to kill you, it is so degrading to destroy another human life that it's better not to wake up on the other side of that nightmare. And therefore the Torah says you shouldn't kill somebody, rather if they force you, you have to allow yourself to be killed. Murder is a cardinal sin, or rape is a cardinal sin. It's better to die rather than wake up on the other side of having raped somebody. Idol worship, too, which is harder for us to relate to because we don't actually live amongst idol worshipers. But idol worship is considered to be so humanly degrading, it's better to die rather than be complicit in idol worship. So it's better to die rather than kill somebody, rape somebody, or involve yourself in idol worship. But this was none of those three. 
So then why was Rabbi Akiva running out to public and giving up his life? It's not one of the three cardinal sins. And if you're really a Talmudic scholar, you'll come back to me and you'll say, no, no, Kellerman, there is a fourth thing you have to give up your life for. If the secular government, as part of a campaign to uproot all of Judaism, says you have to change anything about your behavior, even to uproot just a custom, even if it's not a Jewish law, just uproot a custom. If, if, if Jews wear black shoes, and, which is not true, but if Jews wear black shoes and they come and say, wear, wear pink shoes, since it's part of a larger campaign to secularize the entire Jewish community, you have to die rather than put on the pink shoes. There is such a Jewish law. So since here you could argue the secular government said no Jews are allowed to learn Torah, Akiva had to give up his life for that because it was part of a campaign to secularize all of Jewry. But if you want to make such an argument, I will argue back and say, fine, if the secular government says you're not allowed to learn Torah, then you can't cooperate with that. But who says you got to go out in public and start screaming, who wants to learn Torah? Teach it in your local synagogue. Take people back to your house. Why did he have to run out to public and make a spectacle of himself knowing the Romans were going to show up on the scene? It certainly looks like suicide. And where in a religion that so cherishes life could we possibly find some justification for suicide that makes no sense? We're going to attempt to answer that question within about 20 minutes. And the answer will surprise you. Let's take, in order to understand the Jewish concept of love, let's take the concept of love that I absorbed in the culture that I grew up in. I grew up in Los Angeles, I went to UCLA, I attended Harvard. That is a culture all by itself. American, Western, university culture. So I speak the language of my culture, and I know what the words mean very well. So I could say a proper sentence in English, I love hot dogs. I love baseball. I love my wife. None of those are improper usages of the word. And in all three cases, the word means the exact same thing. It means it's good for me. It's pleasant for me. It's something that I like. When I say I love something, it means I like it a lot. It makes me really happy. It brings me a lot of pleasure. Can I, now watch this. If you have someone from my background walking down the street, and you pull them aside, and you say, hey, do you love her? He has to ask himself some personal questions. Do I love her? Well, how happy does she make me? Well, how much do I enjoy being with her? Well, does she make me feel good? It's all about I, I, me. OK, now, let's flip into another culture. What is the Hebrew translation of the word L-O-V-E? Most of you will say it is Ahava. Ahava. Aleph, hey, bet, hey. Ahava. They translate that as love. What I'm about to show you is that you cannot translate cross-culturally. First of all, you know that all Hebrew words are made up of two or three letter roots. If it's two letter root, it's usually modified by a third letter. The two letter root of the word Ahava is, does anyone know? Hav. Hey, bet. Hey, bet, hav means give. Ahava is the first person future. Ahav. When you put an olive in front of a word in Hebrew, it means I will. Ahav means I will give. Ahava is the state of I will giveness. So what is Ava? It's when I walk around thinking, I, I, I just can't wait to make her happy. I, I just want to, I want to make her giggle. I want to, I want to do something for her. That's a state called Ava. It's I will giveness. Now, if you want to know, you see some, some person from Talmudic culture walking down the street, uh, a second century Talmudic sage walking down the street, and you want to know, right, how does he feel about his wife? And you pull him aside and you say to him, Ata ohevota? 
do you, do, do you have Ava for her? I translate as love, but it's not right. Do you have Ava for her? He has to ask himself some questions. He has to say, do I have Ava for her? I will giveness? Well, how much would I be willing to let go of for her sake? How much will I sacrifice to make her happy? How much of what is important to me or what makes me comfortable will I let go of to make her comfortable? It turns out Ava is not about me, it's about her. So you have here two concepts which using Google Translate will appear identical. And in reality, because of the cultural chasm, they are the exact opposite. Love is all about me, 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 and Ava is all about you, you, you. Now, there are, there are cultural constructs that are built on these two ideas. So for example, the cultural institution that is built on love is marriage. So I want to know what that is. If I want to know what it is, it's very easy to do. Open up the Oxford English Dictionary and look at what does marriage mean. The Oxford English is nice because it brings examples from classic literature throughout history. So remember, the second or the third definition of marriage is a merger of two or more corporate entities. That's marriage, a merger of two or more corporate entities. And it's an extremely accurate definition. Why? Uh, I own a company, and my company is making good profits, and I acquire another unit. Now my company has my main unit and my acquired unit, and we function together for a period. But what happens when my acquired unit is no longer profitable? It's no longer doing something for me. What do I do? Sell it. So what you would expect is, if there's a cultural institution called marriage, then that cultural institution should survive as long as it's profitable for those who got involved. Now, in every relationship, there are periods of highs and periods of lows. During the periods of lows, it is possible I will not be experiencing profit from this other unit that I acquired. So in that case, I should jettison the unit if what I'm involved in is a marriage. So it is not surprising then that what we find is in the West, the divorce rates hover around 50%. Because at some point, I guarantee you, your spouse will not be pleasant, your spouse will not be productive, your spouse may become depressed, your spouse may, may not be giving you everything you intended your spouse to give you. And at that point, according to the cultural milieu, according to the laws of, of this culture, of the culture that I grew up in, you jettison them. And thank God, we would say, you have the freedom to get rid of somebody who is no longer making your life pleasant. That's what's so terrific about divorce. You can dump them. They're gone. The Talmudic corresponding institution, right, which would be parallel to marriage, is something called Nisuin. Nisuin is Jewish marriage, Jewish legal marriage. What is that thing? So again, let's look at what the word means. We'll do it by analyzing the Hebrew word. Nisuin, the root of it is nun, sin, aleph. No say. Nun, sin, aleph means to carry, to carry. Nisuin are carryings. Now that's a bizarre name for the agreement that the two of us will live together. Why is that called carryings? So a great Talmudic scholar once told me, the reason it's called carryings is because he said, Labe, on the day that you get married, you walk under the chuppah, the marriage canopy, you pick up your spouse and you say, no matter how heavy she gets, you will not put her down. And he was not talking about body weight. What he was saying was that Marriage is all about carrying the shortcomings of your beloved. And every person marries somebody with shortcomings. Marriage is a 50-50 deal. I'll put in my 50%, you put in your 50%. I'll take out the trash if you bring home the money. I'll take care of the kids as long as you take care of the bills. I'll make the dinner, you make the breakfast. 
But man, if I'm making the breakfast and the dinner and I'm taking care of the kids and I'm bringing home the money and you're doing nothing, so it's over. And when I come over to Nisuin, it's not a 50-50 deal. Nisuin is a 100-100 deal. The deal is that I promise I will be for, here for you forever. I will carry you. Now, there is a concept of Jewish divorce, but it is in the most extreme, extraordinary circumstances. We're talking about cases of abuse. Otherwise, the deal was, I'll carry you. I'll take care of you. Ah, you're having a rough time or a rough year or a rough 10 years. I'll carry you. That's why we got together. When do I get married? I get married when that person will improve the quality of my life. When do I become involved in Nisuin? When I have so practiced giving that my giving muscle became bigger and I wanted to give more. And then it became bigger and I wanted to give more. And at some point, I wasn't happy giving to people in short-term relationships. I decided, you know what? I want to carry somebody forever. I want someone to be my project, so to speak, forever. I want to love somebody. I want to give to them forever. When my kids were getting old enough to get married, I gave them a beautiful essay. This is what you're getting into. A Jewish essay. This is what you're getting into. When you are so full of love that you want to take care of somebody forever, that's when you step forward to the next step. And it made my kids think twice. And then at some point, each of them said, okay, I'm ready for that. And they stepped forward. And in their relationship, they have this idea, I'm here to make your dreams come true. That's how each of them approaches the relationship. That is classic Talmudic marriage, Nisuin. I remember years ago, there was an actor who played the role of Superman who had an accident. Do you remember this? He was riding a horse. He broke his back. When he woke up from the surgery, he did not know that he had become a quadriplegic. His wife also did not know. The only one who knew was the attending physician, the surgeon, who was standing to his left. His wife was standing to his right. And the surgeon looked at him and said, listen, I have some, some bad news for you. And he explained, this is where the spinal cord is snapped, and you're never going to move below the neck again. And the actor who played the role of Superman looked to his right, and he saw his wife standing there. And he said to her, okay. And she looked at him and she said, what's okay? What's okay? And he said, it's okay if you divorce me. And she looked at him and she said, why would I divorce you? And he said, because I'm not Superman anymore. And she looked at him and she said, I didn't marry you because you're Superman. And this couple lived out one of the most famous romances in Hollywood history. And she took care of him and he took care of her emotionally until eventually he passed away and shortly after that she passed away. That's called Nisuin. I'll carry you. I didn't marry you because you're Superman. I married you because I want to take care of you and love you. It's a very different approach than the Western approach. <clears throat> now, with all of this in mind, let's just run through the story one last time. And now let's try to understand what exactly happened here, what took place. Akiva hears that they have banned the study of Torah. Torah is the system for crafting a human being who will be capable of ahava. It doesn't come naturally. Babies come out of the womb and they say, keep me warm, cuddle me, feed me, calm me in every way, and if you do not do this, I will blast your ears out. And many people remain on that trajectory throughout their lives. You end up with 40-year-old babies. The Torah comes to try to transform a human being into someone who's truly a giver. 
And Rabbi Kiva hears, they've banned the study of Torah. He runs out in public and he says, whoever wants, come learn Torah. He engaged in battle. He was saying, I will not allow this idea to be forgotten from history. That the purpose of life is to love, is to give, is to take care of. One of the students cries out to him and says, secular Jew, what are you doing? Don't you know what they're going to do to you? Let me translate. Isn't life about a comfortable retirement, two cars in the garage, and a really nice villa in France, or at least in St. Moritz? Isn't that what life is about? And Rabbi Kiva looks at him and says, how can I possibly explain to you from the culture that I'm standing in the middle of why I would do such a thing? If all of life is about deriving maximum pleasure and comfort, avoiding pain, how can I explain what I'm doing to you? And so he launches into metaphor, and he says, it's like the fox is walking along the riverbank. This is the Romans. And they say to the Jews, the fish swimming in the water. Water is always a metaphor for Torah in the Talmud. Wouldn't you like to come up here and live with me like I live with you? Wouldn't you like to join my culture? The culture of capitalism, of, 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 of competition, of the, the survival of the fittest, of anyone can become rich as long as they can get past everybody else. Wouldn't you, if, if you're the prettiest girl, then you've got the best date. If you're the richest guy, you have the most power and the most influence. Wouldn't you like to come up here and live with me? And the, the fish look back in the fox and they say, you're the cleverest of all animals? You're not clever, you're a fool. You value that? You think that makes for a better life, a happier life? If here in the water, here we are all training to love, to give, to take care of others. If here we are terrified that we would slip into selfishness, then how much more so if we would come up there with you and give up this guide to love called Torah? The Romans come, they grab him, they bind him, they drag him off, they, they put him into a cell, they build this giant torture platform, they put him out there. As Rabbi Kiva is standing in front of all of his students, making war on selfishness, he decides to close his eyes and fulfill the commandment to proclaim that God is one. When, when, when Orthodox Jews say God is one, they don't mean he's not two. They mean God is unity. There are no moving parts. It's all one. The whole point is oneness, connection, relationship, closeness. That's divinity when you're in a state of unification. And he closes his eyes. He's about to begin, and one of the students cries out, Rabbi Ad Khan, what are you doing? Don't you know that you are excused from doing this? You're in distress. And Rabbi Kiva opens up his eyes and explains to his students, my whole life, my whole life. Imagine the following. My wife is an artist. Imagine this. I live in 16th century Poland. 16th century Poland. My wife, the artist, is in the, the back room. And there's a... There's a terrible hurricane happening out there. Hurricane is I mean, blizzard, it's snow every place. And I'm sitting here with my cousin at the kitchen table. And I go over to the window and I, I wipe some of the frost off the window. Oh my God. Oh my God. My cousin says, what's up? I said, There's a man out there. I go for the front door. He says, what are you doing? You're going to die. You can't go out in the middle of a blizzard. I said, I'm not going to let him die. I open up the door. It's snow five feet tall, I get a stool, I climb out, right? I'm going out in the blizzard, it's complete white out, I'm looking for the guy, and I see some fellow walking through the snow with his hands above his head. My wife, the artist, my wife loves to paint flowers. Her favorite flower to paint are roses. But my wife has never seen a rose because I live in 16th century Poland. I see this guy with his hands above his head in the middle of the whiteout. I say to him, what are you doing out here? Guy calls back to me, I'm a flower salesman from Italy. I walk up to him, what do you got? He says, I got a dozen long stems here, you want them? 
I said, how much are they? He says, 50 bucks a stem. It's going to cost you. I walk from Italy. So I said, just a minute, let me see what I've got. I start pulling out the bills. Meanwhile, my cousin runs up. He says, what are you doing? I said, this guy's selling roses. I want to buy the dozen roses. He says, how much does he want for me? I said, 50 bucks. He's ripping you off. I look at my cousin like he's crazy. He's ripping me off. And I say to my cousin, my whole life, my whole life I've been waiting to buy her the roses. It only cost me 50 bucks a rose. I'm of course going to buy it for her. And I lay out the bills and buy her the flowers. And Kiva said, the only exercise for skiing is skiing. If you run stairs, you'll get stronger quads. But when you hit the slopes, you're not going to have exactly the muscle groups you need to ski. And you're going to hurt the next day. The only exercise for skiing is skiing. The only exercise for surfing is surfing. And the only exercise for letting go of what you want is letting go of what you want. If you want to fall in ava, if you ever want to get to the point where you, you can give the only exercise you can perform is you have to practice letting go of what you want. And Rabbi Kiva, from the time that he entered the yeshiva, was practicing becoming a lover. And in little ways, here and there, he let go of preferences. I want pizza, she wants tacos, we'll go for the tacos. And slowly, 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 he built his muscles of ava until he was capable of letting go of almost anything. In fact, by that point in his life, there was only one thing that he had not let go of. Imagine the following. There's a little child, and this little child, God forbid, their life is in danger, and there's this spinning wheel, and this child is going to die. And the only way to save the child's life would be if I, took, if I took my arm and I stuck, if I stuck it right into the spinning wheel, but I'll lose my arm. Do I have enough love inside of me to let go of my arm? Okay, let's say that I do. Let's say I have that much love. But what happens if it's not just my arm? What happens if it's not just an arm and the other arm and both legs? What happens if it's, if the only way to, if he's going to die unless I give up my life? Do I love enough to give up everything? Imagine the following. My wife is sitting at the table. She's in the kitchen. She's rubbing her temples. I say, I say, sweetie, w w what's wrong? She says, oh, man, my, my head is killing me. Can you imagine waking up in the middle of a marriage and realizing that you don't love your wife enough to sacrifice and walk over to the cabinet and open up the cabinet and hand her the Tylenol? Okay, I do. I love her that much. I walk over. I, I... It's empty. Can you imagine waking up in the middle of a marriage and realizing you don't love enough to get into the car, sacrifice, drive down to the CVS, and buy her another bottle of Tylenol? Okay, let's say I do. But let's say she doesn't need Tylenol. Let's say she needs a kidney. OK, this is really scary. Make it real. If somebody needed a kidney, do I have enough love inside of me to say, go ahead, take it? Be honest and answer the question. Do I have enough? It's a terrifying question. It's terrifying. Have I built that much love inside? And if not, is that a goal in life? That I should love somebody that much? Do I want that much love? Do I want, do I want to be so excited about somebody else that I would let go for them? Do I want to experience that while I'm walking around planet Earth? The student said, Rebbe, Ad Khan? You're going to say Shema? You don't have to do that. You have, an, you have a, an excuse. Legally, you're not required to say the Shema if you're extremely distracted. You're very distracted now, Rebbe. They're peeling the skin off your body. And Rebbe Kiva looked at him and said, 
My whole life, my whole life, I've been waiting to give everything. To serve God with all my heart and with all my soul, to let go of everything. To fight the battle, to keep love alive in the world, to spread the word that the whole point is to give. And now I'm not going to do it. And he closes his eyes and he starts to sing, Shema Yisrael, listen Jews. Hashem Elokeinu, we worship God. Hashem, eh. He started to say, God is one. God is unification. God is love. He's connection. He's relationship. And before he ever got to finish the word one, his soul went out. I turned to my teacher who read that story to me inside and I said, it's not fair. He said, what do you mean? I said, he never got to say the word one. He never completed it. My teacher looked at me and smiled and said, Leib, he didn't need to. He was done with the exercises. He'd achieved it. He was there. It was over. He could let go of everything. The angels in heaven cried out, Zu, Torah, Vizu, Schar, this is Torah, and this is its reward? My teacher said, uh, <laughs> uh, Leib, that's not what they said. I said, Rebbe, I'm reading it inside. I'm looking in the Talmud. It says, the angels cried out and said, Zu, Torah, Vizu, Schar, this is Torah, and this is its reward? My teacher said, no, no, Leib, they didn't say those words with that intonation. The angels in heaven cried out and they said, oh, they said, oh. <laughs> Zu Torah v'zu schara. This is Torah, a system for falling in love. And this is its reward, they said. Oh, this is its reward. If all you want to do is love another person, God will bring that opportunity into your life. He will bring someone for you to take care of forever. You want to give more? Guaranteed, he will give you children. Guaranteed. Anyone who wants children gets them, biological or adopted. There are so many people walking around planet Earth who need someone to adopt them. Everybody needs a hug, some words of encouragement, a smile. Anyone who wants to take care of others will get children. You want to love more than that? You can take care of a community. You want to love more than that, you can take care of multiple communities. You want to take care of more than that, you become a world leader and take care of people all over the planet. Zu Torah v'zu Sahara. This is Torah and this is its reward. However many people you want to take quality care over, you will be given the privilege. And the curtain comes down on the scene as God cries out, Rabbi Akiva, welcome. You have been introduced into the front row in the next world. You've achieved the purpose of human life, which is to become the lover, the one who's capable of ava, the one who can give. And that is the greatest ecstasy that any human being can ever achieve. I'm a UCLA Harvard-educated scholar who spent 12 years in yeshivas. And I stand between these two cultures, which what, what I think is a unique perspective, capable of translating from one culture to another and showing you where the contrast is. <laughs> this place is in front of me, and now it places in front of you a choice. And I hope that this very brief cultural immersion will assist you for the rest of your life in making whatever choice you prefer. Have a good day.